Good evening, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when I was asked to, to do this debate, um, I had to think seriously as to whether or not I indeed supported the motion. Um, because certainly I would agree with a lot of the comments which have been made in the chamber in terms of the challenges that China has in its path, the difficulties that its institutions face, and indeed the very hard and uh, difficult trajectory of becoming um, a significant economic power, in fact, an economic superpower. Um, but I suppose because I'm an economist and I look at what the data has shown and also in my field work talking to uh, people in China, researching their lives, um, I suppose I became convinced that the increase and improvement in living standards is real in China and we should never presume that what we see today in China is what will be in China in even a decade or two's time. I was thinking about um, a way of illustrating how unpredictable the future can be uh, when it comes to uh, which countries can manage um, a big transition. And the movie Back to the Future popped into my mind. Now, I'm aware that many of you will have been born after <laughs> that movie uh, came out, but uh, just bear with me. Um, it starred Michael J. Fox, um, and he was, this is the movie in the 80s, and he went back to the 1950s to keep his parents together. And the scientist he met in the 50s said, you're from the future, prove it, tell me something about the future. And Michael J. Fox said, Ronald Reagan is president. And the scientist said, what, a B-movie actor? You can't be for real, tell me something else about the future. And he said, Japan makes the best stuff on earth. And the scientist said, you're definitely not from the future. The stuff they make is crap. They hardly have a democratic system. They're dominated by one party and they rely on the United States for the development that they have. Okay, he didn't quite say all that, but that's what he meant, because <laughs> this is a Hollywood movie. <laughs> um, but, let me just, but let me just say, I think it's very true that um, the reason that I, the reasons that I struggled with um, whether or not China's economic growth can, can continue um, is something that I have uh, researched for quite a, quite a long time. And I suppose one of the things that I would point out is that the economic growth of China should actually not be a surprise. It should actually be the catch-up process finally taking off for not just China, but for a number of countries. And my next book is entitled China's Growth, The Making of an Economic Superpower. I was very nervous about this title because I wasn't actually convinced that, uh, you know, oh, gosh, what well, if they don't do it? And um, at, a number of researchers told me, well, why are you worried within China? And they said, because China is already an economic superpower. You may not like the way it acts. You may not respect what it does entirely, but the reality is, China is already a bigger influence on the global economy than the United States. And in fact, it's the biggest driver of the global economy and will continue to be so for a number of years. Why? Because it's starting from a very low base. And its growth model is actually changing in this process. A number of points have been made, I thought, um, from the other side, which are very worthwhile. I won't have time to go through all of them. But I want to link my Michael J. Fox analogy to um, China's next challenge, which is the entire challenge of sustaining economic dominance is to join the ranks of rich countries. The fact that Japan did it um, and 13 countries in the post-war period have done it is because they were able to move up the technological chain. They were able to create multinational companies. And there's no guarantee that China can do that. But there are a lot of very positive signs that the Chinese people, the entrepreneurs, the private businesses, they have managed to do that despite what the state imposes on them, despite the fact that the credit system is dominated by state-owned enterprises. In fact, a lot of China's success is in spite of um, the state. And I think you just must bear this point um, in mind because on the simple mathematics, um, China's economy is a $5 trillion economy. Um, as even if it grows to at 7%, which is much slower than what it currently um, had been growing at, the economy will double in size in 10 years. And that means that it will already be within 
less than 20 years, uh, larger than the United States, even as China slows dramatically. Why? Because the United States is a mature economy where a 3% growth rate would be very good because it's at the technological frontier. And that's why China is already economically dominant. It's already the biggest engine. And whether or not it can sustain that depends on a lot of improvements to its institutions. But as I say, do not presume that what you see today is what it will be in the future. Um, and let me make just address a couple of points that were also made about the demography, the one-child policy. Um, I used to be of the very strong opinion that the only way to reverse declining fertility rates, because as countries mature and develop, fertility rates always fall, and the only correlate to reversing that would be to reduce women's education and incomes. I am joking, please. <laughs> um, but I was set straight um, by some Scandinavian colleagues who said, actually, if you had better childcare, um, it's, in it's incredible how quickly you can actually change that system. It's just not, it hasn't been something which has been properly embraced. And of course, the Chinese are very focused on family, as Sir David has properly said. And it's not clear to me that the one-child policy can't be reversed. And it is, this fact is clear to me. The one-child policy has never been strictly enforced in rural areas. And the Chinese population is probably bigger than 1.3 billion. Um, as a result. Um, there's also a number of other points which I'm not really going to have um, time to get into, but let me just quickly say a couple of things about its challenges. Um, China is an unequal society. It is a more unequal society than the United States, but the transfer system of the West is what causes that inequality to fall. I do see that as one of China's challenges. And actually, by reducing inequality, you can stimulate growth, a point that Joseph Stiglitz now makes about the United States. Natural resources, I see that as a significant problem, certainly in terms of the quality of life. Um, but as Lord Wei has mentioned, there are now Chinese enough Chinese in the middle class that a lot of these attitudes are also um, indeed um, changing. And I want to say a word about political instability. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not an expert in terms of the politics. What I do know is that political instability is not necessarily a bad thing. If you look at the history of East Asia, the process of moving from an autocracy into a multi-party system is traumatic. South Korea underwent, well, in a sense, reversion uh, to a dictatorship in that process. Taiwan split with parliamentarians throwing chairs at each other as they battled it out in different factions of the KMT, which I'm sure never happens in the House of Lords. <laughs> um, and this process, though, they came through the other side. And amongst those countries that have joined the ranks of rich countries, they include Taiwan, they include South Korea, they include countries that have done this. And for me, that change in China may indeed be the change that they need um, to have the institutions to support the prosperity that the Chinese Communist Party knows it needs in order to maintain power in whichever form um, that um, it can. And let me also say um, a word about the second point. Remember, um, the very first um, opposer said there were two things that we really needed to address, economic dominance. And I think I've I've said a few things about why China is already there um, by many, many measures. The second one that I struggle with is what is the 21st century? If it's multipolar, then can you say it belongs to China? And I have again thought about this in the sense of um, actually our first proposer, which is centuries are termed and called and noted for the dynamics of that century. It's a narrative. It's not an absolute. The United States dominated the century. Europe was, was played a major part, but it was a century about the rise of American power, America versus the Soviet Union. And it's become, I think, in many ways, the reason I do economics and growth is because, to me, development is the story of the 21st century. This is the century where finally the catch-up process has meant that developing countries around the world now have middle class. People enjoy 
just still a fraction of our standards of living. And the big mystery in development is not why these countries are finally catching up. It's why they didn't catch up in the immediate post-war period, because they were poor. They should have grown faster. So to me, this is the development century. Within the development century, Asia comprises 50% of the world's population. I don't need a, a title around that region. It is the people in developing Asia who comprise half of the world. To suggest that half of the world shouldn't account for half of the world's GDP, I would say, is not something that I would accept. I think it would be very normal for Asia to have that share of global GDP, to be the dynamic engine, and for China to be the center of that. It has, as I already said, more than 1.3 billion people, and it will be, I think, um, the dominant force. It's the story of China and the story of development is why I think that the 21st century has a very good chance of belonging to China. Not to say that other countries wouldn't be, of course, there have good standards of living, be a multipolar world, but the narrative is it will be finally um, China's development and bringing along the emerging world that will define the story and the narrative in the 21st century. I'm out of time, so I'm just going to finish with this. Um, I'm not an expert on hard and soft power, but I do know this, and so Christopher, if you'll indulge me, I, on a Saturday night, wouldn't mind watching a Jet Li film I wouldn't mind watching Zhang Ziyi and, and some epic sweeping across Xinjiang um, or Gongli. And I certainly don't drink Mao Tai, but I also don't drink Heineken's. So I think um, culture will change, attitudes will change, and China was a great power once. It's had a very, very tough century. And I think there's every chance that this century will again be characterized by China's reemergence. And for that reason, I hope that you'll join our side um, and support the proposition. Thank you very much.